Hello there, Ben. Hello, John. We meet once again. Before you can get into it, I just want to say you're going to say something weird, something silly, probably a pun of some kind, but there's no time, John. There's no time. We have oh, man. three releases to get through this time because we oh, re- man. somebody went on vacation during the summertime, and so now we're like one whole release behind. I know. I'm a terrible American. I know. Impossible task. <laughs> terrible American. <laughs> I think you're some kind of Scandinavian, in fact. I'm not actually That's sure right. if you're an American. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. I will. I won't do my. I will skip my my usual shenanigans, and and, and it's okay. We can dive straight into one sixty two. I won't be too offended. All right, let's 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 begin. Rust one point sixty two came out in June, June thirtieth, in fact. So we're a bit behind, but there's got all kinds of features in here. We got to talk about these features. What's the first feature here, John? The first thing here is the new cargo add subcommand, which. You know, it's, it's it's something that a lot of the people in the ecosystem already knew about because it it existed as a separate cargo subcommand that you could just, you know, install. You could do cargo install, cargo add, and from then point forward, you could use cargo add. And now it's a part of cargo itself. And, and that journey has been a little bit interesting because one of the challenges in bringing it into cargo proper was that not only did it have to, like, you know, integrate with all of the internal cargo APIs, but there was also the requirement that cargo add not change any TOML files in other ways than the actual, you know, dependency that they're going to add. Um, and this ended up being a long journey of developing basically a new TOML parser that can like, you know, remember things like white space and comments and exact formatting to make sure that when cargo, when you do cargo add, you know, 30, it will leave everything else in your TOML file exactly the way it was, and then only add the dependency line for 30. And not only that, it has a bunch of other features too. Like, you know, if your dependency list is already sorted, then Cargo Add will make sure that it stays sorted even after you add the thing. So there's a bunch of work on this new crate called Toml Edit that I think at this point they're going to basically swap out the real Toml crate for behind the scenes um, to get something that the Cargo team is sort of willing to adopt into Cargo and have be the, the standard functionality. And do you know if the uh, the add command from Cargo Edit, if it's like totally integrated or is there like some stuff that it does that this doesn't do? Um, I think it's fully integrated now. I, I don't know of any, you know, known shortcomings or, or flags that haven't been ported and stuff. I think the, the API changed slightly. So with Cargo Add, um, I think you specify package and then an, uh, an at sign and then the version. And in... There are other cargo commands like cargo clean where you specify name of the crate colon version. And I think there's still some debate about which of those should be supported, maybe both. Um, but apart from that, I, th- I think cargo add is now just like fully supported as, as part of cargo. And is it all of cargo edit right there? Or are there like, you know, still use cases for having this installed? Like, can folks uninstall cargo edit if they have this new tool chain now is the question? Um, I think for now, they've only ported, ported the, the add subcommand. I don't know whether they're looking at, at porting other parts of cargo edit too. Um, I, I honestly don't know. Right, well, we'll figure it out. I'm sure it's a, a process. This next one here is interesting to me, which is, it's something I've wanted for a long time, which is default enum variants. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about this or can I can I rant sure. about it for a second? I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit, but then you can get into your your, uh, your gushing praise. Great. So basically the idea is uh, on a struct, say, you can derive a default. And like if you're all the elements, all the fields of your struct implement the default trait, then that means that anyone can just call the default function and that you can get a kind of a, a default version, of, you know, a version of that struct with all the default values. But the question is, if you have an enum, um, what should the default be? Obviously, uh, you know, an enum can be w- this or this or this or this. So you see you need like some way of determining what, what the actually the default is. And some folks are kind of like, well, maybe it's the thing in the first position. Maybe it's kind of like, you know, the, if there's only one nullary variant, you know, a variant with no data, maybe that's the one, that kind of thing, kind of being smart. And the uh, the current census is kind of uh, just, oh, no, let's not be smart. Let's just introduce a new uh, attribute called, you know, hash bracket default. And then you put that on the field you want to be the default, and then uh, that just is, you know, you can put derived default as normal on the enum, and now anyone can call default on this, and it all works out. So it doesn't, it doesn't let you, uh, it doesn't change the, you know, the ability to implement default. You could always implement default manually for an enum, but now it's just derivable. Yeah, one thing I think is cool about this is um, the, the fact that it affects the generated bounds. So one thing that... Y- people will probably be aware of at this point is when you derive traits, at least through the standard library, 
Derived trait is not very smart when it comes to bounds. So if you have a type that's generic over T, for example, then if you derive clone or derive default or derive debug, the implementation block that gets generated is going to be also generic over that T, but it's going to have a bound of that trait. So for example, in, in the example that's used in the release notes, you have an enum maybe that's generic over T. Um, and derived default as it exists today would require the T also implement default. That is no longer true for, I mean, you couldn't derive default for, for enums before at all, but now that you can, and but also for, for structs and the like, um, when you annotate a particular enum variant with the default tag or attribute rather, it's a, I think technically it's a macro helper attribute, um, then it will not generate those bounds. So for enum, maybe generic over T, um, it will not say, you know, impl T default for maybe T where T colon default. That that where bound is not going to be included. And, and that's because the if you specify that the default variant is one that doesn't hold the T, there's no requirement that T be default in order for the whole type to implement default. Um, and this is, you know, something they've implemented specifically for this macro attribute, but it's something that, you know, uh, we've wanted for Rust the language for a while. Um, you can think of things like, um, let's say you have a struct that's generic over T, but inside of the struct, you only ever hold an arc of T. Well, then there's no requirement that T implements clone, really, because you're just going to clone the arc, not the T itself. But if you derive clone on such a type, it will still add the where T colon uh, clone bound, um, which is something that you know is entirely unnecessary, and you can you can leave it off if you write a manual implementation. And so this causes, in many case, cases, people to either derive default as an example. Um, and get bounds they weren't expecting, or to have to manually do it just to avoid the bound. Uh, and, and it's nice that they took this into consideration for derived default on, on enums uh, with this default attribute that it will not generate those extra bounds because, because it's only for unit variants for now, there, there's never a need for, for such a bound. Up next, we have thinner, faster mutexes on Linux. And so this is actually a pretty involved one under the hood. So we'll link to some reading material uh, in the show notes for this. There's a great, uh, there's two things. There is a Twitter thread from Mara Bose, who implemented this, the uh, library team lead right now. And uh, there's also the tracking issue for this. It's kind of hard to navigate, as GitHub threads tend to do, but it had, contains all kinds of benchmarks and motivations that you can read through if you want to get into the nitty gritty. But the uh, the underlying idea is, so on Linux, uh, libc, which is the platform library on Linux that gives you all the, the nice things that you want to do with an OS, uh, there's a library called pthreads as part of that. And pthreads is kind of a, a POSIX generic uh, API that gives you threading primitives, stuff like, you know, like not just threads, but also mutexes and other concurrency, some before is a kind of thing. Uh, so basically, as of Rust 1.0, the idea was that Rust's own standard library types on Linux were based on the pthread primitives. And so uh, as of this release, now there are uh, Rust versions of those, a Rust kind of implementation of uh, what, you know, for just for just for the mutexes part, I'm not sure actually about the rest of it. I'm not sure if there are other things still based on pthreads, but for mutexes, now there are uh, Rust native mutexes in stood that the standard library types are now based on. Uh, and there's a bunch of uh, little justifications for this. One is that the types are just smaller. Um, I'm not sure the exact, I don't remember call the exact uh, reasoning for this, but uh, it lets the uh, types be, go from like like maybe like 100 bytes. That's, I, I, think it's, wrong, I think it, it says in the release big. notes, it's like from 40 bytes to five. Yeah, it's from like, it was like quite large to now almost no size at all. And so, uh, so that like that's that's pretty uh, a pretty big deal, first of all. And then also they should be faster, I believe. And uh they are all now also uh, available, able to be, you can now, uh, or, well, you, now, uh, as of the next Rust release, which we're going to in a second, uh, you'll be able to, uh, in, you know, create a mutex, construct one at compile time, so as in a const context. And so all of these together kind of motivate this change, uh, which uh, apparently was kind of uh, traumatic in some ways, I guess. That took a while to happen, do you recall? Yeah, I mean, part of the challenge here, right, is when you're changing something that's this fundamental in the standard library, th there's a lot of making sure that you don't break anyone and making sure that this is actually a sane move to do by default, right? Because the standard library is what lots of people use just because they haven't really 
necessarily thought through having needing something more specialized. And so you want to make sure that the thing that you replace it with is actually, you know, general enough that it really is the right decision for, for most uses. Um, I know that one of the reasons, for example, that um, it, it, it was attractive to get a const constructor for these, which we get in, in 163 as a result of this change, was so that you can easily construct static mutexes. Right, because the when you do a when you create a static, the constructor has to be a const fn or a const, um, you know, ignoring things like lacy static and one cell. Um, I think the other reason why they really wanted to land this change was because p thread mutexes um, can't be moved once you create them. Like their mem their location memory is not allowed to change, which meant the standard library had to box every mutex. Which then, of course, causes you know extra indirection and whatnot, and and often for many use cases, that box, that indirection, doesn't really matter. But in performance sensitive cases, it it really does, and this is why you know this is one of the reasons why I think a lot of performance sensitive users were using crates like Parking Lot because it basically implemented many of the optimizations so that we now get in the standard library for free. Also, the removal of the allocation of the box in this case under the hood means that you can now move this API into core, libcore, I believe, uh, which is you know the uh, the underlying more bare bones version of the standard library. Uh, I don't which, you know, know whether able... that's true. You don't think because so I true? think it still relies on f the Futex API. Okay, that's quite which possible. is based on the 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 sort of OS level primitives. Because ultimately, you need to have a way to signal to the operating system th scheduler that this thread should now go to sleep or this thread should now you know is now uh, unparked. I think though that the the way these are structured is that it's more. It's easier now to plug in new operating systems to get to reuse the, the the same implementation. I think that was a change that made. So now, you know, if you have if you want to add a new operating system to the standard library or support for a new operating system, uh, you can make use of these new improved mutexes. I think by just plugging some sort of simpler helper methods rather than having to re-implement the whole thing yourself. And I believe one of the reasons too why uh, the uh, the versions from p threads were less than ideal was that uh, I guess yeah, C famously doesn't do quite as many static checks for things as Rust does and so to make sure that things you know stay safe stay sane uh, p threads does a lot more uh, dynamic checks I believe than the Rust code needs to mm. uh, I think yeah the idea is that the Rust already enforces these invariants in the type system and so uh, a lot of what p threads is doing is just not needed at all mm, that makes sense yeah, I guess the bottom line is if you're using mutex from stood right now uh, great your code gets faster if you are using parking lot you might be able to remove that as dependency. Uh, if you can, you know, benchmark and see that it doesn't affect your use case, and I think there are benchmarks which we'll link um, in the tracking issue, which show pretty favorable uh, results. I think you know, generally faster in the parking lot, but also like you know, there's, there's all kinds of different use cases for mutexes and different contention levels and readers and writers. And so, uh, yeah, look at it yourself, benchmark and figure it out. But it's a pretty promising beginning, I think. Yeah, it's true. This next one, I know you had a you had a hand in, which is the bare metal x86 64 target. So this is the target that's lovingly named x86 underscore 64 dash unknown dash none. Why this, Ben? Why? Okay, so uh, the the news is this has been promoted to a tier two target. Let's uh let's quickly go over what a target is. So basically, the idea is uh, Rust, as you may have heard, is a cross platform language, so you can compile a program for Linux, for Mac, for Windows. And so, uh, as you imagine, there are some some differences, some important differences between all those platforms, and not just those, but you know, there's every single architecture, every single. Uh, niche OS that's out there. Every single uh, weird, like different version, like you know the muscle user space variants of the Linux things. Uh, those all have differences, and the way that Rust encapsulates and encodes these differences is via what's called a target spec, uh, which is just uh, ultimately just a JSON file which you can just write yourself, uh, and you can you know you know do whatever you want. You can say, hey Rust, like compile for a totally fantasy language or you know sorry fantasy platform that I've invented with these properties. Just be like, yeah, sure, I'll try that, and it might work, it might not work. Uh, and so uh, the idea is that uh, some of these targets are in included with Rust itself uh, and kind of, you know, first class supported in the language um, in the compiler. And those are tier three. Uh, those are the ones that Rust has support for uh, in terms of like they exist in the Rust source tree. They are defined there. And if you want to, uh, you can uh, build uh, four of those targets with the cargo build dash dash target uh, and so on. Um, but there is another thing above that called tier two. 
And so a tier two target uh, is one that not only is included support for in Stood or in the compiler and both the compiler and Stood, uh, but also uh, it Rust ships artifacts for. So it le- this now lets you do Rust up component add uh, target, I believe it's the invocation. Uh, it's target add, I think. Target add, uh, and then the new target name or any target name at all that you want that for sub ships. And that means that you can get it for any, any tool chain uh, since 62 here. Uh, you can just get all the uh, things that you need to cross compile for that target. So it is as simple as uh, using Rust up to get the artifacts and then cargo build with target and then you're set. So it is a uh, tier two makes it very easy to do these kind of things. You can get it for like for nightly beta, all the tool chains. And so it's uh, quite lovely. And so it's not quite tier one. Tier one is, hey, this, this is included and we ship this, but also we test on this, uh, which is an extremely high bar. Uh, getting test runners that can you know handle Rust's knees. There's only like, you know, 10 or so tier one targets, which sounds like a lot kind of, but like, you know, consider those, you know, all the permutations of, uh, you know, uh, Linux and that kind of thing. Like it was Android and uh, that, you know, ARM and Intel and, you know, all these kind of things. We can leave a link to the uh, the Rust Forge page with the platform support uh, matrix so you can kind of see and get an idea of like what targets Rust has visual support for. Um, but yeah, so the uh, that's the idea of what a target is and why we added this. This new target here, uh, in case you haven't heard of a target triple, every target is named uh, with a number of components in it. Uh, and it's called a triple even though it has like an arbitrary number of components for many as you want. It's a terrible name. Uh, we didn't invent it's it. It's real it's, bad. It's, it's very real old. Bad. But yeah. it usually begins with the uh, name of the CPU architecture and and then the CPU vendor, and then uh, the OS, and then sometimes the user space, and then sometimes other stuff too. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, and but like half of the fields are optional. So a target triple can actually be <laughs> two items. I think even one, but it can just be two items often. Uh, yeah, so a typical one you might see, like say you have like a, a normal uh, Intel computer and you have Linux. And so whenever you type cargo build, the default on that platform, when you got when you got rust up to install your thing, you will have the default for that target, which is going to be x86 64 four dash unknown dash linux dash gnu all right uh, so the four element triple as is appropriately weird um and so it tells the rust hey like we're on uh an x 64 cpu we don't quite know who the vendor is so don't use any like vendor specific stuff if there even is any i've never even heard of any um and then you know you, you are on linux so use like you know linux's libc stuff and then you know actually you know, use linux it's some linux stuff like l floaters and stuff i guess and then the gnu libc is the last component there for the target triple uh and so uh this new target x 64 unknown none if you can you know let's follow this through so it's for x 64 uh, and so again, no vendor and then dash none. And so what does that mean? It means there's no OS there. And so if you are writing just for bare metal, just a program that when it's compiled, will just run straight out on an Intel or not Intel an x 64 CPU, Intel or ARM or whoever built it, uh, this is what you want. And so if you're doing embedded programming or say if you are writing an OS, this is what you need, because obviously you can't compile for an OS if you haven't written it yet. Uh, so I also, you don't, you don't really want to be running an OS on an OS, which kind of, I guess, is kind of defeats the purpose, right? So, uh, this new target that we've added, I guess, I guess, well, I guess once in a while I can shill for the company I work for. If John can shill his book, I can mention <laughs> that I work for a company. Uh, so my company, uh, sponsored this, I guess, uh, is the idea. Uh, and so it's, it's useful for everyone, anyone writing an OS or any kind of embedded thing in Rust. And there's plenty of other unknown, non targets for other, uh, CPU architectures. And so in our case, we kind of have like an extremely weird setup where we have a uh, sort of a miniature OS that's like Linux compatible. Uh, in embedded into the product that we create, uh, it's, it's it's so weird. Maybe we should talk about this. My my, my company thinks it's so weird and so strange, but I love it. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that we but previously we were trying. Uh, it, we were he had to compile uh, if we wanted people to be able to to easily build our thing and have to like you know install artifacts by hand to figure out like where all the the stuff is on the system. Uh, it's much nicer to have people to be able to use Rust up. And so uh, in this case, now that it's tier two, um, we can now start using this because previously to actually use Rust up, we uh, we actually shipped this OS miniature OS thing as being compiled for x86 for unknown Linux muscle, and muscle is the statically linked ver- version, like user space uh, variant of compared to GNU. Uh, and so, but then we had to do all kinds of like weird hacks to like change the target features to, you know, d- disable hardware floating point support and like get rid of the, the the CRT runtime, which required like linker script hacks and like weird build RS stuff. And so with this new uh, target, it's much nicer. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. If you're writing embed stuff in Rust, this is the thing you want to be looking at. Yeah, well, one way you can think about these target triples is that the the first part of the triple is going to be what assembly does it produce? 
Like, does it produce machine code that can run on, you know, uh, ARM processors or x86 or, uh, or uh, you know, i686, whatever? Um, the second one is, are there specific um, variants of an OS uh, that matter? So this could be things like, I think, Solaris and NVIDIA are two that are in use. Like I think the the target triple for Solaris is something like Sun dash Solaris, and for Nvidia CUDA it's like Nvidia dash CUDA. But in general, that second one is for variants of the thing that comes next. Um, the third part of the triple is what things are available in terms of the platform standard library. So this is mostly has to do with system calls, where that third bit is which system calls can you issue. Right? So on Linux, you would issue system calls differently than if you were on Windows, differently than if you were on Darwin, differently than if you were on iOS or Android. Um, and then the last one is usually, uh, as, uh, as Ben was saying, you know, libc variants. So this would be if there are variants of the platform. So these are not who vended the platform, but within that platform, there are variations like, you know, the difference between uh, GNU and Muscle or the difference between the different um, floating point mechanism on uh, like uh, Cortex embedded CPUs. So this could be like EABI or EABI HF and all of those variants at the end. Um, and so with unknown none, it's really just saying the only thing that matters here is the machine code, the, the assembly. Nothing else is defined. Like you don't have access to anything else, which is also why this platform is a, is a no-stood platform. Yeah. And if you're curious uh, what fields exist for target specs to kind of like, you know, as the nitty gritty of like, what is it, how do compilers actually, you know, cross compile and like build for different machines? Uh, maybe we can link uh, here the, uh, the, the, the Rust file that can, it parses target options is well documented and has uh, comments for every single option here. So it's just a, a compiler, Rusty target source spec mod.rs, and we'll link to that in the show notes, and you can kind of read through it and kind of uh, take a look at. It. There's there's a lot of options here, and most of them are probably almost always ignored in almost every target. Uh, there's like maybe a hundred or more. Nice, yeah, that makes sense. All right, I think we're up to stabilized APIs. The first one I wanted to talk about here was the total compare or total comparison for the floating point type, so F32 and F64. This is something that's been debated for ages is the fact that the floating point types in Rust do not implement ordering. Like they don't implement ORD or partial ORD, the, the two traits for ordering in Rust. Um, and the reason for that is because Ordering floats is not entirely intuitive. Um, th there are many reasons why, but many of them include things like the fact that floating point numbers have multiple variants of infinity. They have negative and positive zeros. They have uh, not a number as a, a sort of inherently encoded value. Um, and so ordering gets a little weird. And rather than try to, you know, stabilize an ordering implementation for floating point that everyone can agree on, sort of figuring out what that wrapper looks like and what the guarantees look like. What they've done with total comp here is the IEEE standard that defines floating points also gives a, this is how you should compare floating point numbers. Um, not necessarily in the sense of giving a total ordering, although that is the result of it, but it's just saying this is the ordering mechanism that should be used, and it is supported by you know some of the hardware platforms, although not all. Um, and so by landing this as a completely separate API, what they've done is sort of sidestep the issue of what should we standardize as ordering being and saying, let's at least give a mechanism for comparing them. And then we can decide later on whether that should actually be used for ORD or whether the behavior of that is, is too unintuitive to also derive ORD and have this decision be decided you know, implicitly without the user's knowledge of the fact that they're, open, uh, they're opting into a kind of weird definition of ordering. Right. If you click the uh, link to the documentation, which we can include in the show notes, you can see the actual ordering that gets used where it's like negative nan, negative infinity, negative numbers, negative subnormals, negative zero, positive zero, and then, you know, positive in the reverse direction for all of those. Uh, and so uh, if that's, you know, floating points are kind of weird. Yeah, I would say order them at your own risk. Uh, this is better than nothing, but I also uh, be careful. <laughs> Figure out what you actually need. Yep. 
Um, the other one that I thought was neat here is that the standard in type has gotten a lines method. So this is, you know, if you do standard in uh, and you just want to loop over the lines of standard input, which is pretty common in like Unix command line tools, for example. Previously, you had to like lock standard in, put it in a buff read, and then call lines on the buff read to get the, the lines out in an efficient manner. Now you can just directly use the lines method on standard in. So you can do, you know, IO colon colon standard in parentheses dot lines. And that gives you an iterator that you can then just loop over to, to walk all the lines. It's a very nice just quality of life improvement here. Is it possible that, I, I forget, maybe I'm just misremembering, but I think this might be something that was, uh, wasn't was possible before uh, borrow checker improvements. Am I thinking of something else entirely? You could be right. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk about um, buffering for standard out. Um, around, you know, should it be buffering by line or should it be configurable to make it not buffering and stuff? Um, I don't know of any such discussion or anything about bar checking for lines, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Another one that, that you brought up for stabilized APIs, Ben, was the the fused iterator. Have you done more research to figure out? Uh, you, I got such one a tangent. I nerd sniped you a little bit, I think, with this. Yeah, you know you did. So so there there's a listing in stabilized API that um the fused iterator trait is now implemented for the encode wide FFI struct on Windows. And you know the, the, the this raised a lot of questions or rather Ben raised a number of questions of this to me and and made me go down a bit of a rabbit hole of okay, what what is fused iterator what is the fused iterator trait? Why is it valuable for it to be implemented on this particular FFI struct? And also, why do we need fused iterators in the first place? And I, I don't know that I have all the answers, but let me try to give a, a quick survey here. So fusing an iterator, this is a, a method on the iterator trait called fuse. When you fuse an iterator, you're basically injecting a little wrapper around it that makes it so that the moment the iterator returns none the first time, you're guaranteed that it will return none forever. This is not normally a guarantee of the iterator trait, right? So if you have an iterator and you call dot next and it gives you none, nothing prevents you from calling next again and getting a sum after that. In general, though, you know most of the APIs in Rust sort of assume that that is the case. Like if you write a for loop over an iterator, it's going to stop the moment you get a none. But there are cases where you might call next multiple times and actually care about the fact that you only get a sum in a, in a prefix of your calls to none. And that's what Fuse will, will ensure. Um, I haven't found too many compelling uh, use cases where Fuse is useful. I've seen some where you want to do things like parse out version numbers from a string. And so you do like split by colon, and then you call next three times and stick it in a three tuple and then match on the tuple. And by fusing it, you know that if you ever see a none on sort of one of the leftmost parts of the tuple, the remaining ones are also none. But all of these you know, you could work around without Fuse. So, so I guess maybe it's a, if you need to reach for this, it's nice. Um, and the Fused Iterator trait is a sort of optimization trait where if an iterator implements the, the Fused Iterator trait, which is just an empty trait, um, what you're saying is, I promise that this iterator will not return none, uh, will not return some after having returned none. And what that enables through basically specialization in the standard library is that if someone calls fuse on such an iterator, it won't generate any wrapper. It'll basically be a no-op because it knows that the underlying iterator already effectively fuses. Which then brings us back up to the top of the stack, which is why does it matter to implement fuse iterator for encode wide? And all I can find on this is and code wide is a fused iterator. It guarantees it doesn't return some, and therefore it should implement the trait. So it's sort of a tautology of just like, it already behaves this way, so it should just implement the trait. More of like a, a cleanup without really giving a reason for whether anyone specifically wanted this. It's like I wanted a, a, a breadcrumb trail of what led someone down the path of why on earth doesn't it implement this trait? I don't know. Um, but but that's the extent to which I have an answer for you, Ben. All right, and then lightning round for uh, other changes, detailed changes. Okay, so I only have two from the detailed release notes. Um, the first one is that Cargo now accepts dash capital F as an alias for dash dash features, 
which means that you can now write cargo commands much faster by not having to write dash dash features all the way out all the time. Uh, and then the other one is a lint that has become deny by default, and that is the unaligned references lint. So this lint is used for if you take a reference to a field of a struct that is packed. So that means one of its fields might not be aligned according to the alignment required by its type. In Rust, the, the requirement is that every reference is always aligned. So creating such a reference is uh, undefined behavior. The reason why it used to be permitted is it was the only way to compute the address or the relative offset of a field in a pack struct, which you need for all sorts of FFI purposes. So there was a, a crate called adder off that basically did this for you, where it would take a reference to the field and then cast it to a pointer immediately and sort of hoping that this was OK. Um, now we have an adder of macro in the standard library, which I think we talked about in a past episode, that internally uses um, an unstable feature called raw references to do this without triggering undefined behavior. And so at this point, they've moved this lint of trying to take a regular reference to an unaligned field um, and turning it from a, a warning into just a deny, because you should never be doing this. It is not OK. Uh, and I think those are the only two things I had. So I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to accept that we move on to the, the next version. Half an hour in, we've got two left. Let's go. One Rust oh. 1.63. So. Well, so, okay, I have to interrupt you, Ben. <laughs> go uh, on. Technically, we have three versions left because oh. there was a Rust 162.1. Uh, that said, 162.1 is a release that we can mostly just skip over. Like, it basically fixed some unsoundness, uh, accidental regressions, um, as well as, I think, one known CPU vulnerability on Intel SGX. Uh, so there's not really that much to talk about. But only on like Fortanix or something like that. Not even on... Yeah, something yeah, like that. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay uh, pretending it didn't happen and also pretending that the 125 and 125.1 releases of Rustup didn't happen uh, and just move on straight to 163. All right. So there's a pretty big headline item here in 1.63, scoped threads. John, what are scoped threads? So scoped threads are... Something that used to exist in Rust um, and then got removed in what's known as the leak apocalypse, which I think uh, Ben has some context on, but we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. By used to, we mean before 1.0. That's Wasn't it in 1.0 and then got it removed after? No, 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 no. It, it was like in the 11th hour. It was like the month before 1.0 came out. It was a last minute Rust job to get these out of stood. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So scope threads are essentially, um, let's contrast them with regular threads. So when you use the regular standard thread spawn function, uh, you provide a closure, and that closure has to be static. What that means is you're only allowed to give it references that live for the entirety of the program or give it ownership of anything that you move into the, the closure you pass to spawn. And the reasoning here is that you know if thread A spawns thread B, there's no guarantee that thread B is going to stop before thread A stops. It could be that you know thread A exits right after it spawned thread B, and thread B keeps running for forever. And this means that if there are local variables in A or in the call chain to A, it's not safe to pass those to B, pass references of those to B, that is, because... It could be that they go away right after when A exits and B tries to keep running and using those, those references, which would then just be dangling. Um, and so that's why the, the spawn function requires the closure to be static. Now, it turns out that in many cases, you do know that thread A won't exit until thread B is exit, which namely is if, you, if thread A spawns thread B and then tries to join thread B before thread A itself returns or exits or whatever it might do. In those cases, it's okay to give B references to things in A because you, you know that the lifetimes are going to work out. You know that those references are not going to be dangling. And this new API, this, this scope thread API, tries to encode exactly this in a way where the, the type system is going to guarantee that the thing that spawns the threads will wait for the thread that gets spawned, and therefore the references are fine to pass. And the way it does this is a little bit weird. Like th there's some type trickery going on here that makes the method signatures a little weird. But basically, when you call standard thread scope, you pass in a closure, and 
inside of that closure, you have access to one of the arguments to the closure, which is a scope. And that scope that you're passed, you can use to spawn threads. So when you call scope, so when you call standard thread scope, you do not actually create a new thread. No thread gets created immediately. It's only when you call dot spawn on the argument that's passed to the closure that you pass the scope that you create new threads. So this looks something like, you know, you do thread colon colon scope, open bracket, pipe S, pipe open curly bracket. And from that point forward, you can use S dot spawn and pass in closures the way you do to thread spawn today, with the exception that anything inside of those closures is allowed to reference values from, from outside of, uh, of the closure, basically as part of the, the spawning thread. And the reason why the API has to be a little bit weird like this is to actually guarantee that we that, that people can't pull shenanigans inside of the closures to make those references leak, which used to be the case with the, um, the old thing that got removed just prior to 1.0, which I think brings us to the leak apocalypse. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Ben? Right. So it's a, it's a great kind of like little history lesson here because kind of it was a time when it was kind of a, there was a fight for the soul of Rust kind of happening without us realizing it. And so uh, before 1.0, I mean, obviously before you know, the language gets big, there's a lot more room for things to, to change or to be up in the air. And one of those things was, what does unsafe mean exactly? And so uh, there were kind of like two camps pre 1.0 where kind of like unsafe is used for memory unsafety, things that can be memory unsafe, which is defined pretty narrowly as, you know, like uh, two threads can currently access or a thing uh, or one is uh, one is a read and or one's a write and they aren't synchronized or whatever, something like that. Um, and then, you know, there's also uh, the other camp back then was kind of, well, unsafe should be for like anything that's kind of generally undesirable, right? Kind of like an un unsafe is kind of a way of just like, you know, denoting places to be careful in the code, right? Uh, and so uh, before 1.0, a lot of kind of like libraries are getting stabilized uh, pretty rapidly. A lot of like things are being considered. And then like about a month before 1.0 was like scheduled to be released, uh, this was dis discovered. And so um, pretty much uh, it boils down to the fact that leaking memory uh, was considered unsafe previously uh, in Rust, not because of any kind of like memory safety implication. In fact, there was, I don't think there's any, any way to actually uh, violate memory safety except through this with leaking memory. Um, but the idea was like, hey, like, so should this actually be unsafe or should it be safe? Because the idea is trying to figure out, trying the alternative is trying to figure out a way that you can actually statically prevent the concept of memory getting leaked. Which is it's trickier than it sounds. Um, there are there were several proposals, and like maybe in like an alternate universe, like Rust pursued those, and to this day, like big memory is still considered unsafe, uh, right? Um, but uh, the solution that eventually pretty much uh, everyone went with was kind of okay. Well, so all these like you know these functions like mem forget, which has always been understood, uh, was just marked as safe, and so now uh, you just you know need you know, you can always guarantee that safe code, you can always assume, you must assume, that safe code can just leak memory, uh, which matters in the case of leaking destructors. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, there's a, there's a better uh, write-up of this by um, Aria Bangeser, uh, which will, uh, I'll link. It, was a, it has a pretty evocative title. It's called Pre-Pooping Your Pants with Rust. Uh, which is in <laughs> in Aria's typical sort of uh, <laughs> tone and writing style. Uh, I recommend reading it. Um, it's a great kind of historical artifact. Uh, it has all kinds of code examples. And it shows the problem. And so basically the way that we've reintroduced this is just to change the API. There was a different API back then. Um, and so uh, I'm happy to see this. Happy this is kind of back in because it really, uh, ThreadScope is a great way of, of showing off Rust's kind of like unique selling point of like, you can use threads and not worry about it. Uh, it's like, you know, in, in like, you know, years past and like, you know, decades previously, using threads was always kind of a recipe for pain uh, and try to avoid it. And with Rust, the idea is let's like put the script, let's actually make it so that threads are actually kind of pleasant to use uh, and have kinds of like nice niceties. And so, uh, yeah, check it out. And uh, I think it's pretty sweet myself. Yeah. And I think that the, you know, the, the reason why things were broken back then was because the, the old thread scoped would return a guard type that would block when it got dropped, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the idea was, well, if it blocks when it gets dropped, then we can guarantee that A won't, in the case of A spawns B, that A won't exit until B exits. 
And this breaks once you can leak values, right? Because you just take the, the join guard you get back from scoped and you just mem forget it and it vanishes. And now A is allowed to exit, but B is still running. Um, and I think though the way this came up, because there was a lot of debate about whether mem forget should be unsafe. And then someone realized, you know, you can implement mem forget entirely in safe code using RC, right? You just create a reference counted cycle and then stick the thing in there. And now you've effectively leaked the value and you've only used safe code. Um, and so through this like line of conclusions, it became obvious that, okay, thread scope the way it was back then is broken. And the difference now in this new API that, that landed was that here, there's no guard. There's nothing that that deals with the destructor. It, the closure is the, the scope that's being used to enforce that you actually wait for everything inside. You can't, you know, uh, mem forget the closure halfway through its running. Uh, and, and that's what makes it safe. Um, the next thing that came up is uh, in the 163 release is Rust ownership for raw file descriptors and handles, also known as IO safety. Um, this is something that introduced two new types to the standard library, uh, the borrowed FD type and the owned FD type on Unix. And I think on Windows, they're called like borrowed handle and owned handle. So these are still operating system dependent values. But the idea here is that these new types um, are more semantically rich variants of the raw FD type that we had previously. So the raw FD type used to be, at least on Unix, and I think there was a, you just use C ints on, on Windows. Um, so a raw FD is really just a Unix file descriptor. The challenge with having just a file descriptor, which is really just a number, is that you don't know whether you own that file descriptor or whether there are other copies of it floating around because they're just it's just a number so it's copy it could just you know it can be duplicated or it could not be the idea with having these two more semantically rich types is that a borrowed fd is sort of akin to a reference like you have a reference to this file descriptor but when it gets dropped you don't have any special requirements like you don't need to call close or anything as opposed to if you have an owned fd or in windows an owned handle it is your responsibility to make sure that you call close on that file descriptor or handle when it it goes out of scope now, of course th this is separate from safety right because the operating system is going to close all file descriptors when the program exits but if you have an owned fd you know that you're at least supposed to you know call close on this to release uh, that resource when you're done using it yeah and i think there might be uh, other motivations here too i know it's from dan goman who works on uh wasm time uh and is currently working on uh stuff with relating, relating to uh capability oriented uh uh, so there's a, he has a project called Cap Stood, and so basically it's a version of the Rust library with uh, capabilities, where the idea is you can kind of like request a certain uh, uh, permission to do a thing, and then uh, pass like say like you know a permissioned object around and say hey, I've, I've been given permission to this code to do this thing uh, as a way of uh, like securing various other things. It's, it, you should look and read into it yourself. It's kind of like a it's pretty nifty, mm. uh, and uh, it's being used for uh, WebAssembly stuff, as far as I know. So I think it's maybe part of that. Yeah, I, I know that there's more work going on for IO safety that that I think builds on these two relatively primitive types of borrowed FD and, and owned FD. Um, but at the very least, to, to me, this this separation between those two make a lot of sense for um, basically conveying more about the value you're handed, what you're supposed to do with it, and having that be enforced through the type system. And then I'm sure you can use that to build, you know, more useful. And, and richer abstractions on top of it. This next one is the constification of mutex, RW lock, and convar initialization, which we already talked about in the section on 162. So I think we can move on to the turbo fish for generics in functions with impl trait in arguments. Um, do you want to start with this one and I'll, I'll take it halfway through? Sure, kind of an obscure one. And so uh, if you recall, uh, so Rust has generics. What? It's, it's true. It's true. Let me uh, let me enlighten you. Rest has generics, and to do you mean uh, search replace? Yeah, pretty much. That's that's how you can think about it. Why not? Uh, the idea is if you have a function that is generic over any type, you can give it a type parameter after the name. So you type fn foo angle bracket t closing angle bracket, and now your function has access to a type parameter that is generic of any kind, uh, unconstrained in this case. Um, and so, but there is a a second way, kind of a bit more like you know convenient 
uh, added to do simple generics added in Rust 2018, where instead of having to manually uh, declare a type parameter, you can just say uh, in the argument list for your function, you can say impl something. And so uh, where something is the name of a trait, so uh, it would be the equivalent to, you know, usually the more or, less, more or less the equivalent of saying fn foo anchor bracket t colon something, some trait. Um, so basically the idea is you say how you, you accept any type imp implementing some trait. And so, uh, but obviously there's, there are a few differences here, mostly syntactic between uh, the classic style, uh, adding generic parameters and using this kind of like more convenient sugar for impl trait stuff. Uh, so, and uh, classically, one of the differences is that uh, the turbo fish couldn't be used if any of the parameters in your function uh, were impl so on because the question is like well where do they go how, do, how does this work and so like, you might have for example a function where first argument is like impl foo second argument is impl bar and third argument is also like impl foo it's like well should that like where do these go if, like, if, if argument one is like impl foo and that itself has its own parameter and then how do you turbo fish this and turbo fish is just a, a way of calling a function with giving it you know just you, know, you say if I function foo you say have the uh, invoke it as foo colon colon angle bracket and then the type parameters in there so it's just a way of passing in uh being uh explicit about the type parameters to a function that's turbofish and so in the past if you had any uh impl trait arguments to a function at all you just couldn't use the turbofish uh to call that function and now uh the the change is if you have a function that takes both generic uh classical uh the uh, type parameters with the anchor brackets and an impl trait so kind of an obscure case i'm not sure why you do this but people maybe might now you can uh, use the, the turbo fish just to fill in any parameters that are declared the uh, the old way, the the uh, classical way. Yeah, so I actually use this in at least one of the libraries that I maintain, where yeah? I have explain yourself. You know, so, <laughs> so this is in the imap crate, where I have a method that is it takes a, a username, which is a stringly variable. Um, and it takes an authenticator. And the idea here is that the authenticator knows how to run some authentication protocol with the server, but the username is really just a string. And here, I for the username parameter, I just want to use impl asref stir because that's all that matters to me. Um, but for the authenticator, they're actually like somewhat convoluted bounds. And so that that method is you know, fn authenticate angle bracket a end angle bracket, and then it takes as arguments, you know, username colon impl asref stir, comma authenticator colon a, and then where, and then lots of bounds on a. And so that's an example where I actually combine the two because the, the impl makes a lot of sense for some of the arguments, but not for some of the others where you can't use impl trait if you have particularly involved bounds as an example. And so th in those cases, this kind of change is pretty important. I, I think the reason why they didn't make this change before was because they I think they were wondering whether um, you might want the ability to explicitly give the types even for impl trait arguments. And so, you know, by by doing the stabilization that they've done in 163 here, they're basically saying, well, if we're going to add that, they're going to be added in a different way. They're not going to come through the turbofish because now we've stabilized that you can use the turbofish and you only have to specify exactly the generic type parameters and not any impl trait arguments. You can imagine that in the future, you get the ability to do things like, you know, a colon type annotation, for example. So if you have a, a function where one of the arguments is an impl trait, when you call that function for that argument, you can give, you know, the value of the argument and then colon and then explicitly type what you give in there, but it's not going to happen through the turbofish. Um, there's another item in 163, which we've talked a little bit about before, um, which is that the migration to non-lexical lifetimes is now complete. Um, and, you know, non-lexical lifetimes, we're not going to go over again, but basically, uh, I think when the 2021 edition landed, they had mostly moved away from supporting non-NLL. Um, and it was mostly being used for, I think, backwards compatibility checks or something. Um, and now as of 163, they've actually completely removed the old borrow checker from the code base, which lets them you know, do a bunch of code cleanup um, as a result of not having to keep both of the borrow checkers uh, alive anymore. 
I think the uh, the biggest uh, user facing change here is that uh, the error messages should be uh, different, but also generally better with the new implementation. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, and we'll in the show notes link to uh, whatever episode, we'll figure out episode we talked about this before and link to it there because we're already uh, rushing. It's a rushing episode. Uh, there's a there's also a link to a, a a blog post that talks a little bit about a little bit more about the stabilization of NLL. And it also talks about where we go next, because there is a sort of next step beyond NLL. And it's through a project called Polonius, which I don't know whether it's made a lot of progress over the past few years. But the idea is basically to have the borrow checker be a standalone program that that knows more rigorously how to how to reason about you know, borrow checking in lifetimes. Um, it's it's something that's still a, a research project and not really something that can be run in production in the compiler. Um, but that's where we're hoping to go next, which is going to give even better error messages and support even more use cases. Yeah, I think uh, in this case, the reason that the the migration from the old borrow checker to the the modern one uh, was difficult was because the new one fixed uh, various problems, bugs that were unsound in the old version. And I'm not sure if any of those kinds of bugs exist between Polonius and LLL. So it might actually be entirely painless for all I know, whenever it does happen. Yeah, I think the challenge with Polonius is more that it hasn't been very rigorously tested on like real world code. Like I don't mm-hmm. think anyone has run like a crater run with Polonius, for example. I think it's more, you know, it's it's being built sort of in isolation and the hope is to be able to integrate it with the compiler and for it to, you know, be strictly better in every way. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I mentioned before about the error messages. I know like uh, uh, before this merged, I was helping someone uh, in the Zulip in the, the rest of the lip, just uh, asking questions. And uh, they had a pe- right problem with the bar checker. They couldn't you know, figure out what the output was trying to tell them, the error message. And so I just like pasted it into the playground uh, and then ran it using Polonius, or ran it with the uh, the new version, which had the bar- the uh, NLL turned on by default. And I was just like, oh, here's the new message. It's much clearer and like, you know, tells it much uh, easier to, to parse and understand what your problem is. And then I ran it with Polonius as well, and it got even better. And so I yep. think it's uh, just a, it's a, it's a bright future for bar checker errors, at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. There's at least one issue that's uh, that's mentioned in that NLL stabilization blog post too that I've run into many times and had to work around, and uh, I, I hope it gets fixed one day. Up next, we've got stabilized APIs. The first one here, Array from FN. I think you were uh, excited about this one. Oh yeah, this one I like a lot. So you know, now that we have const generic. Const generics, um, people are starting to use arrays more, and that's nice. Um, but one thing that's annoying with arrays is that if you have a an array whose length is dictated by a const generic and you want to construct it in some way, it's actually really annoying to do so. You can trivially do so if the values of the array are copy, because you can use the you know, square bracket, const value, semicolon, length of the array, as in n, for example, n square bracket. And Rust will just construct an n length array of those const for you. But if you have a, a value, or you want to instantiate a value for every item in the array, you can't do that with without unsafe code, at least not until now in 163. So in 163, we now have array from fn, which you pass in a closure. And that closure is given the index of the um, item in the array to generate. So this way you can just create an array of basically an arbitrary length and to, you get to decide how to construct every value of that array without using any unsafe code. So this is just another one of those, the standard library gained a feature that's going to remove a bunch of uses of unsafe. Um, box into pin is actually similar. So the, the next item on the stabilized APIs list is uh, the into pin method on box, which lets you turn a box of something into a pin box of something without doing a reallocation. And this only really matters if you're writing relatively low level async code, but without this, you have to always remember to use box colon colon pin to construct your pinned heap allocated future or, or, you know, other value that you want to use behind pin. And now it's okay if it's allocated with just box new and handed to you. You can still turn it into um, a pinned heap allocated value using this into pin. Um, you also mentioned, Ben, that you were pretty excited to see these um, new try reserve methods on the various uh, you know, allocator heavy, heavy types like binary heaps and OS strings and path buffs. 
Yeah, in kind of a an abstract way, I'd say, not because I want to use these methods, but more because of what it represents. Kind of, uh, this comes out of the work people are doing uh, in the Rust for Linux stuff, and so uh, the idea here is that. Um, so the rest of the library, if you're using the uh, stood part, which is the part that allocates, there's you know there's there's different layers, the deeper parts. So there's core, and then between core and uh, so there's also alloc, which is a smaller library that just just as allocation stuff. Um, uh, the idea is that if you are writing a type or you know, creating uh, a type in stood like a vec, you're using just vec new, uh, it allocates behind the scenes, and most of the time that's fine. That's totally cool. Um, but what happens if the allocation itself fails? And so this is a classic problem from like you know uh, a C or like you know back in the day before memory was like you know uh, we had gobs of it all the time. Uh, is that you know allocation might just fail? It might just be out of memory, and then what do you do? And the question is, the, the answer actually to that is a lot of the times you just crash anyway, because like, well, if you have no memory, then something's probably gone wrong. Unless you have some cache to, to vacate or something, you're kind of just out of luck and you're just dead no matter what. Uh, so, but if you're an OS, that's kind of a, an unappealing proposition. The idea is the OS should gracefully at least try to handle and recover from these kinds of things. And so if the OS, the OS itself uh, tries to allocate, it doesn't want to have to, or, or if you're writing, a, let's say, like a component for the OS, say, like a plugin, uh, then you want to, it to be well behaved. And so the idea here is that this just makes it so that all the various types in STUD uh, allow you to uh, try to allocate and if not, handle the failure somehow, if you if you can. So here, uh, if you uh, care about this, you can begin using these things and uh, actually start handling your allocation failures. Yeah, as opposed to it, I guess, panicking or, or even just aborting outright. It wouldn't even panic, it would just abort. Yeah. So there would be no chance of it, it would bring your entire process down if you uh, allocation failed. So uh, any other other problem too on modern uh, like Linuxes at least is that uh, because of overcommit, um, the OS like doesn't what well, doesn't even signal uh, allocation failure uh, properly half the time. So you have to you know trust that the OS is not lying to you. So <laughs> I took a, a, another deep dive in the in the change logs again, and I found a couple of things that are neat. Um, the first one is that Cargo has gained a new flag called dash dash config. Um, and the dash dash config flag lets you override cargo configuration parameters without having to construct or modify a cargo configuration file. So this means you could do something like, you know, cargo build dash dash config um, build dot targeter equals. And you can, you know, override what target directory cargo is going to use for that invocation of build. And you can pass a multiple time to override multiple config options. And I think you can even pass a path to a configuration file that that run of cargo should also incorporate into its config just for that run. Uh, so this is a nice way to be able to, to specify somewhat more ad hoc cargo configuration without having to resort to like mangling config files in the middle there. Um, another that's neat is that the code that gets generated when you run cargo new has changed slightly. Specifically, I don't know if you've run cargo new for a while, but when you run it, it generates you know a, a little function, and then it generates a mod test that has a symbol test in it called it works, and all it does is like assert two plus two equals four or something. Um, and now that mod test has gained a new line. It now also includes use super colon colon star. And the reasoning here is that this is almost certainly what you want to do anyway. If you have unit tests in a mod test, chances are you want to test the things in that same file, which means in the super module, which is the thing outside mod test, which is the current file. And so this is something you know most people ended up adding manually anyway. And now that that very common usage pattern is just going to be encoded directly into the generated file for you so that you're exposed to it. Um, I found two new platforms that have been added. Uh, one is the compile target for Apple Watch OS. Uh, these have been added as tier three platforms. So they're very low on the list. These are just really, you know, we we know what architecture they use and the the basic, you know, uh, platform definitions. Uh, and the second one is that we now have support for the standard library on uh, Nintendo 3DS. So previously, we already had support for Core and Alloc, but now you also have uh, the standard library, I think with the exception of threading, but you now have like file system access and access to things like um, sleep, and mutexes and stuff uh, that all now work on, on 3DS. 
So you'll have no threading, but you do have a mutex? <laughs> yeah, they haven't added threading yet, uh, which apparently will come in a follow-up PR because it requires more complicated changes. I don't know exactly why, but everything in the standard library except for threading. And the last one I had was, so there's a, a mechanism in the standard library for joining strings, which is if you have a, a slice of strings, you can call dot join on it in order to join all those strings by some delimiting string into one new string. And previously that only worked, worked for strings. And now as of 163, uh, it also works for OS strings. Um, so OS string is this slight variant of uh, regular strings in Rust where they're encoded according to the operating system you're compiling on, as opposed to always using UTF-8, which is what the normal string type does. And so now if you have a, an array or a slice or a vector of OS strings, you can now join them using an OS string as well. This is a nice quality of life improvement. I think that's all I had. I'm prepared to move on. Let's do it. Let's charge Rust ahead. 1.64. Yeah. We are on track to finish within an hour and a half. I think we can do it. We can do it. All right. First item here, uh, enhancing dot await with into future. So let's dive into this. Um, the idea here is that uh, if you recall, async await, pretty big feature, probably the biggest single feature that Rust uh, added post 1.0. Um, and you can, you know, you have you have futures and you can await them. And it's it's pretty good. Getting better all the time. Uh, and so, uh, but in the original RFC for async await, uh, there was a, uh, a little, uh, uh, an overlooked kind of feature of the RFC, which was the ability to have this into future trait. And the idea was that the await operator should, uh, de-sugar by call first calling into future and then awaiting, uh, whatever the result of that future is. Uh, this is an analogous to how iterators work. So if you recall an iterator, so if you, uh, type, uh, for X in foo, open bracket, uh, you don't need to type foo.iter. You don't need to actually make the iterator. Uh, the for syntax will just call uh, iter for into iter for you. Uh, and so any type that imp uh, implements the into iterator trait uh, will uh, automatically get an iterator out of that. So this is kind of analogous to that. Uh, and so uh, it, was, it was overlooked for like, quite a while. And then I believe Sean MacArthur, who is the author of the uh, Hyper HTTP library and then request a HTTP client uh, was like, hey, like, what happened to this feature? I want to use this for my crates uh, for some API or something like that. Uh, and so he implemented it and added it and that kind of like got it in here. And uh, the, the, the docs for it kind of like don't really show off like why it's good. Uh, it's one of those things where it's like, you can imagine that, like, you know, it's kind of like operator overloading that, you know, which Rust also features. Like, you can imagine someone, like, you know, misusing it uh, and, like, doing it poorly. And I think a lot of the docs kind of, like, just show off uh, that it exists um, and kind of, like, don't think about, like, when you would want to use it. Uh, and so I think um, one of the potential proposals was maybe if you wanted, uh, like, a tuple of futures and then, like, await the tuple itself, then it might join the futures for you. That's, like, one proposal that I've seen floating around or various things. And maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But now it's just a, an option essentially, for uh, making a way a bit more ergonomic. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, this is something that the, the Rust does in a, in a couple of places. You mentioned into iterator. This also happens for the question mark operator. Yes. Where if you propagate an error using question mark, it actually passes through the into trait or I, technically, I think the from trait at the moment, even though it really should be into, but it can't be for for reasons. Um, and so this this isn't the first time Rust does this. It's not even the second time it does this. I think you know where the where there's some concern is you know the the possibility of misuse like you talked about, and the other is that there are some known cases where Rust is not optimizing the code well enough, where if the into does nothing, it should really generate no additional assembly. Like it should come with no overhead. Um, and I think at the moment, there are some cases where that's not true. Although I think those are considered basically optimization bugs, like missing optimizations that, that really ought to happen. It was true when it was first merged, like uh, I think two years ago. And I'm not sure there's been results since. So we should you know, look it up. I haven't, but I don't know. <laughs> Um, this next one is C compatible FFI types in core and alloc. So this is um, a change where it used to be that all of the FFI types in Rust, so that is all of the types that Rust knows about the C equivalents that you might use for FFI were only in the standard library. So in, in stood, they were not available in core or alloc, even though they're not 
really, you know, they don't require an allocator and they certainly don't require an operating system. Um, and so there was a, a, it's been a little bit unfortunate that they've been only available in STUD because it meant the crates that were no STUD couldn't make use of these types and had to grab, you know, something like CUINT or uh, CCAR um, from either from the standard library and not be nosted or grab them from something like the libc crate. Now, all of those C underscore type aliases are available in the new FFI module, which is both in core and alloc and in, in std. Um, and that includes things like cstr uh, and cstring for, for alloc. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the libc crate maybe and, and why why these were only placed in std to begin with? Yeah, so I mean... There's uh so there's a crate called libc right and it's kind of a, a big mess not big now for anyone's fault it's kind of it's a libc itself is a, a rather old kind of uh, API kind of like I mean, imagine it's libc crate the idea here is to kind of abstract over the differences between the libc library as it exists on lots of like Unix or POSIX ish platforms uh, and so it's kind of like it has all sorts of things in it. And one of the things kind of like there's two distinct categories of things. One is C stuff. And so like, you know, like these things, these, these types, like, you know, uh, it contained definitions for, okay, like what is the, how, what is the size of a, an int of this platform right here? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so like, you know, you can ask for, give me, give me a, a type that is as big as a C long or a C short or whatever. I guess short's always eight bits. I have no idea. It's weird. Um, the C standard is weird. Yeah. Who knows? Um, but that's, that's kind of category one, because like, you know, the on any given platform, the C ABI like that is pretty much fixed. It's almost impossible for them to like change the major parts of any kind of like a C ABI uh, on a given platform uh, as used by the OS itself and, you know, as blessed by the OS. Uh, and so um, but there's also other things that like aren't in like, that aren't in this kind of like this core zone. And so you might imagine like anything to do with like the OS itself, like libc is you know, the entire platform uh, library for the entire platform. So it's not just like fundamental types like, you know, what is an int? It's also things like what is like this particular kind of file handle on this particular kind of niche OS? Give me the exact like struct layout with all the, the padding and alignment and like weird fields that it needs. So uh, that's kind of like the separation here. And so it's historically, uh, originally, Press 1.0, uh, I think stood even, didn't contain anything. I'm not sure if these are how old these types are, but famously, it didn't contain any kind of uh, void type for a long time. And then um, uh, shortly after 1.0, I believe people like clamored for it. And so a, a void type was added to stood uh, to export people to use. And then uh, in the process of upgrading libc to use this void type, uh, which was a breaking change, uh, it caused like a massive fallout, which you, you've heard of the, we talked about the leak apocalypse. Well, this was called the libc apocalypse. Uh, and so uh, we have, we are fond of uh, apocalypses. declaring apocalypses. <laughs> apocalypses. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so uh, to this day, people are kind of like wary of ever changing anything in the libc crate, uh, which is fine for the core types, as I mentioned, because, you know, those rarely change for any given platform. But like platforms are not stable. They do change lots of the various smaller types all the time in between like, releases of the OS. And so what does it mean to try to like pretend that the libc crate is like stable or, you know, it won't ever change, which we are afraid of ever, you know, you know doing other libc apocalypse. So uh, it's it's nice to see over time various things be added to uh, core and stood in a uh, backwards compatible way with the hope that maybe someday uh, the libc crate can see some kind of improvement where like the, all the core like, you know, types that uh, are frozen in stone and can't be changed can just be like in stood the library that itself can't be changed. And then maybe that after that libc kind of like splinter into a thousand different platform specific libraries that can safely uh, use Ember uh, to actually uh, uh, communicate whenever a platform does, in fact, have a breaking change and then use all the nice like tools for managing uh, versions that Rust already has, which today we can't because libc is a giant monolith that can't ever break its API. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of nice acknowledgement that, you know, some of these types really are stable. Like the definition of C car is not going to change in C. It, it can't. Um, I, I just looked it up. So the... The C types in standard OS raw, so the the old module that was standard only, landed in one Rust one point one. Okay, yeah. So 
a bit late, but not that late. And I think one of the the uh, reluctance to add it directly to core back then was that there was kind of a an unspoken policy that libcore should never be platform specific. And I think over a, a long enough period, the uh, observation is just, hey, like people just need these, and they're going to rely on the libc crate to get them if they can't get them stood. And it's just as platform specific there as it is here. So uh, might as well just have it in stood, have it in core, I guess, so that you know if you're writing an embedded. Uh, stuff where you know places things places where you might reasonably want to interface with a a C interface, uh, then it, you can just use them without having to add a new dependency. This next one I know is something that a lot of people have been waiting for f- for a long time, which is that Rust Analyzer is now available via RustUp, so you can now do your RustUp component add Rust Analyzer, and it will work not only on Nightly but also on Stable. Now th- there are some caveats here. The first one is that. While this component has been added to, you know, the the manifest, the stable distribution of Rust, it is not yet a component that Rust Analyzer ships a proxy binary for. So what that means is, even if you install the component, you won't be able to just run Rust Analyzer from your command line because that's not going to be one of the the binaries that RustUp adds to your path when it's installed. Um, there's a change to Rust Analyzer to add that that I think is making its way out, and there'll probably be a RustUp release soon that that has it. But in the meantime, you have to specifically run RustUp run stable Rust Analyzer in order to run it if it's installed this way. This is the same thing you had to do if you installed RustUp uh, through Nightly, um, where there too the, there was no such uh, proxy binary available through RustUp. Now, that said, even though it is available on Stable now, you know, it has the same caveat as everything on Stable, which is that Stable is inherently supposed to be a relatively slow-moving thing. Um, so we get a new release of Stable every six weeks, and by the time something gets to Stable, it's actually 12 weeks out of date, right? Or when I say out of date, what I mean more is it's been 12 weeks since this branched off of the master branch of Rust itself. Um, and this is true for Rust Analyzer as well, because it's gone through six weeks of beta and then uh, six weeks to reach stable. Now, what this means in practice is that if you install Rust Analyzer through RustUp, you're going to be running with a version that is somewhat old. Now, 12 weeks is not the end of the world, but you should be aware that it will mean that you're, you'll be a little bit out of date on new you know, feature releases or bug fixes to Rust Analyzer, which tend to come fairly rapidly still, like Rust Analyzer is still very much, you know, under active development. Um, and so you might want to, you know, slow down on updating things like editor plugins, because your editor plugin might implement, um, you know, support for new features that they then try to use with your installed Rust Analyzer. And if you got it from Stable, it might not support those yet. So there's a little bit of a sort of impotence mismatch here between your your update schedules of Rust Analyzer itself uh, and the editor extensions. Now, if you're using the official VS Code extension and, and for many of the other editor plugins too, they will still continue to download the releases that are provided directly by the Rust Analyzer team. Um, so the ones that are available on the Rust Analyzer release page. And that's a good default. Like That's probably what you generally want to be using unless you specifically have a reason to be using the one from Stable. Um, the, the biggest win, at least in my eyes, for having it distributed through um, RustUp and through the regular Rust release process is that it gets built with Rust. So you know it's built with you know, the same tool chain, the same release process, the same glibc. And the other is that it's much more accessible to new users. Like it'll be the, the install instructions for Rust Analyzer are now very straightforward, as opposed to being, you know, go grab this binary from this random place on the internet, uh, which can be weird for people who are used to mostly installing th- things through their package manager, for example. We have another uh, new big ticket item in in 164, which is an improvement to cargo that has been pending for a while, um, and that's the ability to have workspace inheritance. The way this comes up is if you have a cargo workspace, so you have a bunch of related crates, and those related crates have you know, shared dependencies or shared properties of their of their package, such as, you know, they all have the same homepage, they all have the same repository, they all have the same author list, they all use the same edition, they all take a dependency on 30, anything like that. Where previously 
they still had to declare those separately. So you would have a cargo toml for every member of the workspace, and each such cargo toml would have you know duplicate information. All of them would have to list the homepage, list the repository. Um, if they all took a dependency on Serti, each one of them would have to list Serti as a dependency. They would all have to give which version, uh, a list of features, that kind of stuff. And now with 164, you can actually declare, um, you know attributes of the package and dependencies directly in the workspace. So in the workspaces cargo.toml, there are new sections, workspace.package and workspace.dependencies. And then in the workspace members in their cargo.toml, you can now say something like, you know, square bracket dependencies, and square bracket, surdy equals, and then open squiggly brackets, workspace equals true. And what that will do is that member will take a dependency on Serti that's exactly the same as what was declared in the workspaces dependencies. So this is a nice way to avoid duplication between workspace members and to ensure that all of them actually stay in sync with one another um, by keeping all of the, the salient information in one place, which is in the workspace cargo toml itself. Um, there's also separately the ability that, that has now stabilized in Cargo to build for multiple targets at once. Um, so you can run Cargo build dash dash target, you, you know, x86, uh, 64, unknown Linux GNU, dash dash target, x86, unknown none, to, to build both of those targets at once. And Cargo will make sure to, you know, paralyze the build and whatnot. Um, so this is a uh, just a nice improvement if you do actually do multi-target builds. Um, you could always just run cargo build twice, but this way you actually get to, to overlap the executions in, in, in one uh, run of cargo. Um, for stabilized APIs this time, um, I don't know that there are any big ones that stuck out to me apart from the ones that are already talked about in the release notes. Oh, wait, that's not true. There's future poll event and task ready. Um, so these are... Functions, uh, well, this is one function and one macro that are used a lot for people who end up handwriting implementations of futures, where in particular, the, the ready macro is one that it's a fairly simple macro. It's sort of like the question mark operator, where if you have a, a poll, so the, the type poll, uh, and you use the ready macro on it, ready will return early if the the inner poll value is pending, it will return pending from the current function as well. And if it's ready, it will instead you know, yield or, or give back to the, the assignment it's used in, the expression it's used in, um, use the value inside of ready. So this is used for things like you know, in your future poll implementation, you want to um, return early if you still can't make progress. Otherwise, you just want to basically unwrap the value. Exactly the same as what you do with errors with the question mark operator. And the polyfn helper is used to be able to, in, a, in an await block, specifically call something that requires you to call a poll function instead of awaiting it. Both of these are very low-level implementation details that usually you will not need when writing async code. But for people who do have to write this code, it's very nice that these are in the standard library now because it means that they can usually get rid of a dependency they might have taken on the futures core, futures util crates, because now these are just in the standard library. So hopefully it's going to remove one of these mostly at this point redundant um, dependencies from the dependency closure. And that's it for the stabilized APIs, but there's a lot of errata to talk about here at the end here. So first of all, uh, the first note is that uh, there the compatibility guide for this. Uh, we talked about in the last episode, I believe, how uh, Rust has a certain baseline for the age of Linux and uh, libc that it targets. And so the idea is that Linux and libc add new things to uh, over time, new APIs over time. But if you want to be really compatible with old versions of the OS, uh, say that the language of the, the standard library, or if you want to generate things that you know are compatible on even things that uh, are you know ten years old or more, you can't use anything that's as newer than that, right? And so every so often you need to bump the baseline, which means removing support for some old, by this point, relatively ancient version of uh, of, of Linux. And so I believe uh, the new ones are. We talked about this last time, made the actual dates, but I believe they're still about ten years 
old, maybe only maybe only like eight at this point. And so I think uh, Red Hat six was now like is now out of date, and Red Hat seven is the uh, the newest uh, enterprise grade uh, old thing you might need to see supported with Rust. Yeah, it's the same, and I think Debian six and Debian seven are no longer supported, but Debian eight is. Yeah, I think the idea here is that uh, if you are running some extremely ancient version of this OS uh, for whatever reason that you haven't upgraded off of yet, then uh, you just need to stick to an old implementation of Rust because uh, by this point you've demonstrated that you've, you're pretty cool with uh, being on pretty much unsupported platforms. And so uh, it's just a it's a matter of Rust can only lag behind for so long and eventually LLVM itself does remove support for all these things, in which case Rust's hands are tied. Yeah, I think that's a big part of the forcing function here. And it's also, you know, you start accumulating cruft of not being able to make use of, of uh, more modern, you know, variants of system calls, for example, that may be, may be more efficient. So it's a, it's a general, like, if you, if you force everyone to use the lowest common denominator, then you end up holding everyone back, including spending more effort on trying to maintain this complex, you know, matrix of which things are supported where. The uh, next thing in the notes here is that some of the types in Stood had their layout changed a bit to become more efficient. Uh, so IPv4 adder, IPv6 adder, socket adder v4, and socket adder v6. Uh, and so in the past, any crates that were trying to mem transmute and uh, you know, any crates that were assuming the type layout was stable uh, could would have been broken by this change. And uh, in Rust, it's always you always assume that the unless there is a uh, the wrapper is C. Or, or unless documentation says this is stable, then the type layout is not stable. It is always detail of the compiler itself. And so uh, by changing the sizes and uh, alignment, or the fields of these types, now uh, some crates were broken. And so the uh, compiler authors worked with those crates that did break, which I found through Creator, and then issued new releases and all that kind of stuff. So uh, pretty, it's a pretty great. It's, uh, Creator is such a good, good thing. Every language needs Creator, frankly. Oh, yeah. Cr- Creator is fantastic. Um, another interesting thing that that's come with the compatibility notes this time is that now that Rust Analyzer is being shipped on stable, they're also going to deprecate RLS. Uh, there's been a separate blog post about this. It's not going to happen in 164. It's going to happen in 165. And the way they're going to do it is that so RLS, the Rust language server, is like the old implementation of the language server protocol for Rust, and it was built in a way where it was very tightly coupled to the compiler, which is one of the reasons why it it was a bit of a nightmare to maintain. And one of the reasons why they want to deprecate it is because it, there's a bunch of code in the compiler now that's really just cruft to support RLS, even though most people by this time has, have moved to Rust Analyzer. And in the next version, what they're going to do is they're still going to ship a binary called RLS but in practice, it's actually not going to implement any features. It's just going to return, respond to any you know, edit or query with this has been deprecated, install Rust Analyzer itself um, instead, which I think is a, is a nice way to approach this kind of deprecation because it means that for users who are still using RLS, at the very least, they'll be told what step to do next, as opposed to just suddenly updating and then their editor breaking saying the command RLS doesn't exist. Next up, we have on Windows, the Rust compiler is now built using profile guided optimization, which increases performance of the compiler itself by about 10 to 20 percent uh, while you're compiling on Windows, which is a pretty decent increase. What is profile guided optimization, Ben? I was going to say uh, it is. So uh, I like to think of it as kind of like a static JIT. So if you're familiar with like you know a, a just-in-time compilation from like JavaScript or Java or whatever, the idea is that as your code is running, something in the background is watching your code. And it's saying, hey, like it looks like you call this function over here like a lot. Let's just optimize this one function real quick here in the background, and then next time you call it, we'll just like slip it in there, and then it just gets a little bit faster. And so the the idea here is that with profile got optimization, uh, you basically same thing. You run the program for a while in this kind of context where there is a a, a program watching it run, and it figures out, hey, like it looks like you're using this function a lot, and this function a lot, and this function a lot, and then it generates a profile, and then next time that you you can then use that profile to compile with PGO, uh, and it will uh, take extra care to make sure that the functions that you call a lot are optimized. 
And so this gets used for all kinds of uh, really big projects. Like, you know, I think first time I heard about it was about like, uh, Chrome and Firefox both use this. It's one of the reasons why uh, producing a release build of either Chrome or Firefox on, you know, on like the actual like the serious uh, releases takes, uh, I think, over 24 hours because they do all kinds of like benchmarks and like test runs to like make sure the profile is like actually representative of actual user uh, use cases. So uh, it's a it's a pretty involved thing. It took a lot of work and it takes a lot of uh, resources in the CI. But obviously, those are those changes are uh, too big to pass up. There's another one that that I didn't even know about but until I read about it here, which is that um, Rust warns you. I mean, this this already was the case, right? Rust warns you if there's a a struct that has a field that's not being used in your program, and I never noticed, but Rust does not warn you about fields of tuples that are not being used. And that's something that changes in 164. In 164, there's now a lint to um, to get warnings about unused fields in tuples. Um, it's currently, I think, allow by default, but they're going to change it to warn by default in some future version. Um, and this seems really sensible to me, right? Like it, It's the same reason why fields and structs that are unused get warned about, which is you probably do, you can probably remove this field now. Um, so I, I thought this was a, a nice thing to call out because I honestly had never thought about the fact that it didn't warn about them. Is there anything else that you have in your uh, little list of uh, detailed notes? Yeah, I have a couple of things from, from the uh, release notes. So one of them uh, is, is from Cargo yet again. And this is about the dash dash jobs parameter, which... Um, if you're not familiar with it, Cargo, for anything that does a build, it accepts a dash dash jobs parameter that lets you say basically how many tasks Cargo is allowed to do in parallel. So this includes things like, you know, how many, uh, how many crates can it compile in parallel? Um, if you're building binaries, how many binaries can it build in parallel? All of that, all of that stuff. And dash dash jobs normally takes an integer value, which is, you know, how many jobs can you run in parallel? And now with Rust 164, Cargo allows you to pass in a negative value for that parameter, which is counting backwards from the number of CPUs that you have. So if you run like Cargo build dash dash jobs minus two, what you're doing is telling Cargo, I want you to use all of my CPUs to build except for two. Which makes a lot of sense, right? This is something you might actually want to add to um, configuration files that you're going to share across machines that might have different core counts, where often you might want to leave some CPUs untouched so that like your browser doesn't start to freeze up or whatever. Um, so this is a, a, a fun little improvement that you know uses a nice mechanism, a nice interpretation for negative numbers. We also got a new uh, tier three target, which is the Nintendo Switch. Very exciting stuff. Uh, I kind of want to try try that out right now, but I also don't want to break my switch. Do you have a support stood like the 3DS one does? Um, that's a good question. I don't think no. It does not even have an allocator yet because I think they're they have to clear like legal questions with Nintendo about whether they're allowed to land support for the allocator and and lib stood because I think they're like restrictions about they basically have to sort of well, what's the word um reverse engineer what the api is for the platform or they have to like extract it from the nintendo sdk which has like all these like it has a user agreement and stuff so they have to figure out are we allowed to basically encode those parts of the sdk inside of rust's standard library but i thought that was interesting another thing is is a set of uh, optimizations and improvements to the derived traits in the standard library. Um, and these are all made by Nicholas Nethercott, who's been doing a lot of really cool optimization work to make Rust C faster for, for years now. Um, and in particular, what he's been focusing on in, in this sequence of PRs is to make the output of you know, things like derived debug, for example, on structs, um, produce less code. And, and this is partially to reduce runtime, but much more so to reduce compile time for crates, where if there's less you know, generated output, there's less for, at least in general, there's less for Rusty to then parse and understand and, and turn into machine code. And so it's, it's a fun you know, sequence of optimizations. You can look at the PRs and actually see what code it generates and how it generates less code now than it used to. 
Um, and th there's also another optimization that um, Nicholas posted on optimizing VEC inserts. And this is one that I, I thought was interesting, not so much because of the optimization itself, but because it speaks to the fact that there's still really low hanging fruit for optimizations in Rust. So this is the insert method on vectors for the case. So insert takes an, an index to insert a value in and shifts everything after that index over so that the element you insert actually goes to that point in the vector. And the, the, this PR just optimizes the case where the index is the same as the length of the array. Because if the index is the length of the array, you don't need to shift anything over. So you can just do a push. And so you can skip a call to the, the shift function, even though the shift function is going to do nothing, you can skip that call entirely, which turns out to have some, some decent per, uh, performance wins. And so I thought it was fun that like no one had implemented that optimization before. And I, this, this um, makes me feel hopeful that there are other such optimizations that if you just go digging a little bit in the right places, you might find similar uh, things you can improve. Um, I think that's all I have. And that's it. We're just about at an hour and a half. We didn't quite make it underneath, uh, unfortunately. I blame you, as always. That's okay. I'll, I'll take the blame. <laughs> actually, no, here's the thing, though. So actually, uh, in fact, we did not miss a release. We did it because we wanted to change the parity of our, our, our cadence here, our cycle. Now, next time, we'll begin on an odd and end on an even, which is extremely important. If you think about well, it, we'll you know? see. But the problem now is now you're now you're giving one of the the fun punny introductions that I wasn't allowed <laughs> to give for, as an explanation for why we're late. I mean, not late on purpose. Listen, by this point, everyone's already left. No one's listening to this. <laughs> Uh, that's true. I mean, maybe that's a, a good time for me to give my reasoning, which is that, you know, in, in uh, English, you have the expression of third times the charm. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in Norwegian, the variant of that expression is all good things come in threes. And so this is really me saying, you know, in good Norwegian tradition, we're going to have a better release if we do three releases at once. Or maybe it means this is our, our only good episode of the podcast to ever be made. I mean, yes, that that is what it means. Po also possibly true. Yeah, entirely true. So in that note, uh, let's end on a high note. <laughs> All right. In that case, I think we should uh, we should go return to our slumber. And then we're going to come back in who knows how many releases from now. It's going to be a wild surprise. Only two. I can only rent the room of the library for free for two hours. And that's not enough time to do four episodes, four, four releases. Well, not with that attitude, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> all right we will see you all at some future release all right farewell farewell goodbye auf wiedersehen do, do you know any other any other languages how do you say it in norwegian halabra halabra sure that's that's pretty close <laughs> <laughs> all right see you all bye bye <laughs>